name is Aaron Micklow, and I'm here with Russ from Good Riddance. How's it going? Going good. So, Good Riddance has been a band almost as long as I've been alive, and when you guys first signed to Fat Records, it was still being run out of Mike's Kitchen. How was that when you first signed with them compared to how it is today? It's for us, it's about the same. I mean, we, we feel like they treat us great. They treat us like family. Uh, when we got signed, when we were recording our first album, they were just moving into the first office, the actual real office. So I remember helping move shelves and boxes and stuff, just like we were part of the, the crew. Uh, so for us, it really hasn't changed much. We ha we have modest demands, and and they don't and they leave us alone and let us do our thing, and they they support us when we ask them to, and it's been a great relationship. That's cool. Yeah, I can I can only imagine. I mean, just how the label has grown, and I think it's so awesome the loyalty that you've had with them and just stayed with them all these years because obviously you're happy and. Um, it just that's so crazy to me it's just out of his kitchen and all these years later it's this huge label with all yep. these festivals and you know you guys are a well-established band now too and it's it's just been such a, a long road to from there to now yeah we who had who knew it was gonna be like this you know we were just we were really fortunate we were in the right place at the right time we were working hard as a band and everything just worked out you know we couldn't be happier that's cool yeah so I've heard several times that um, you guys struggled when you first started out playing punk music in the narrow-minded Santa Cruz music scene of the 90s while also trying to maintain not succumbing to going mainstream from that time where there were bands like The Offspring and Green Day. What was it like navigating through those challenges? Going mainstream was not never an option really for us. I mean, we were, we were never sought after or courted by any any of those kind of people. Um, Santa Cruz in the 90s, it wasn't really, it's, I mean, it's a pretty open-minded town and there's a lot of really cool kids there and there's a lot of good music that comes out of there. It's just hard to, I think it's hard for bands to get out of there because it's, it's insular and so most bands uh, a band would have to feel like they, have to, they would have to move to San Francisco or LA mm -hmm. to like be successful and so to be from there and to make it out uh, is tough Yeah. and then also every time there was a cool venue it would shut down either the city would shut it down or the mainstream rock promoters in town would shut it down or we would shut it down ourselves by not me personally but yeah. people acting like idiots tearing sinks off the walls, fighting, stuff like that. Ruining it for everybody else. Yeah, yeah. You know, and we'd, then we would go to Europe and we'd be like playing these clubs that, that like Black Flag played in in 1980 and the club's still there and it's like, because they actually like, there's like some people that have a, I like it when there's a scene where people realize that like if we fuck this up, we're not going to have anywhere to see shows. Yeah. So they respect it. They think about the bigger picture instead yeah, of just yeah, being dumbasses. Yeah. And, uh, and not, I mean, Santa Cruz is a lot of cool people and we would go from one venue to another. So there was a lot, was like during that time, like the nineties up to 2000, there was like two or three pretty, pretty cool venues that we would always play at and they had all ages shows and, and it was a, it was a really good time. that you guys raised over two thousand dollars by selling your stage banner um, for the earthquake in Mexico last year mm -hmm. and you guys are also involved with a lot of other charities um, what motivates your philanthropy and can you talk about some of the charities that you work with I'm trying to think of well I mean I've always for me punk music has always had like I've not been able to separate it from po political and, and social awareness mm -hmm. and that's probably just because of the bands I listened to when I got into it but so like yeah we can sing about all this stuff we can play shows that are reasonably priced we can talk about stuff on the stage that we're concerned about what else can we do and on our second album I thought about donating some money from each record sold and I remember calling the label 
to see if they'd be if they would support that. And they said not only would they support it, but they would match it. That's awesome. Which was great. And so we've kind of done that uh, through through our history, picking out um, organizations that we feel like could use the could use the support, could use the awareness, mm -hmm. and then and mostly it's been stuff that's more uh, oriented to Santa Cruz where we live but also to like PETA we've donated money yeah and we've also had PETA literature at all of our shows for yeah, years yeah yeah so. Yeah, I read that, that you used to put it out at your merch tables kind of, you know, before smartphones and the internet made things so easily accessible. You'd kind of just bring awareness to it in that way. People buy some merch and then, hey, here's a little bit of info about, about some other stuff that you cared about. Well, people like free stuff. Yeah. And then hopefully, <laughs> hopefully they read it later. Yeah, yeah. And then they go, wait, why, why am I drinking milk? It's for a baby cow. So, you know. You guys played Mexico for the first time last year. How was Mexico unique from all the other countries you've played over your career? We didn't see a lot, and we were only there for two days. Okay. So I, I can't really speak to too much like as far as the scene though was it was the the fan base any different like the shows how the shows were put on the so vibe the, so the, energy. the one thing that we played was was your like your off limits thing yeah and we were like the odd band out on that bill so it was sort of a tough barometer i couldn't it would be hard for me to say like we played a, a show a headlining show to like what we would assume to be Good Riddance fans. Mm -hmm. We played to like a festival where we were like the wimpiest band on the lineup. Because it was all this like gnarly, like me heavy, like heavy hardcore bands and stuff. Okay. Like Integrity and bands like that, which was great. I mean, a lot of those people are friends of ours and a lot of those bands I fucking love. So I was stoked yeah. to be there and be part of it. But it was, a, it was the crowd was, uh, were great. And then the next night, we we were at, we were hanging around and we were with this guy that was was kind of driving us around and he goes my buddy's bands are playing my buddy's bands playing the show mind if we stop by so we popped into this show there was like 50 people there and and we got up on this on stage and barred this band's gear and we played like seven or eight songs it was super fun that's cool and uh, people went crazy and other than that uh, I mean I was stoked because I can speak Spanish so I was like yeah. talking to everybody and like. Really cool. Um, was that the show that um, Dan from Death by Stereo joined you on? You heard about that? I saw it on your um, your Facebook oh, and your okay. Instagram, and it looked it looked like a really cool venue. So Dan was hanging out with us because it, it, just because he had nothing else to do. Yeah. And we we you know we've been friends for a long time, and we weren't planning to go to a show or play a show that night. Mm -hmm. So we stopped there and we got up on stage and there was an extra guitar and we were like, yeah, Dan, you should play. And he's like, okay, and he's you know he's he can. He's such a great guitar player, and our songs are not like, not like rocket science. So he yeah. he kind of got the gist of it, and then Chuck would yell at him like solo, solo, and he would just start doing his thing. You know, it was super fun. With over two decades of experience, what advice would you give to a new band just starting out? Drop everything and run the other way. <laughs> yeah. Hasn't turned out so bad for yeah. you, though. Well, I always wish there was uh, a class that a band could take who was just getting started and had some sliver of success. Mm -hmm. Because there's a lot of things that, that we encountered that, we, that I was not prepared for. So I would, I would be wanting bands to like go see a therapist together <laughs> Aww. or, um, I don't know, find out about the industry, the way that the, the nuts and bolts work just as far as royalties and things like that, because things start coming at you really, really fast. And we were completely unprepared. Yeah. And I think most bands are, you go from playing, like being a local band, playing like a show every couple of months 
to suddenly you're touring six, seven months out of the year and you're just grinding it out. And then there's suddenly there's like people asking you, well, who wrote this song? Who gets money for that song? What is about, what about this? I remember one time our second album, we should have known better. We were going on a U.S. tour, mm -hmm. and it was going to be like five weeks. So we needed all this merchandise. We need T-shirts and stuff. Yeah. So Fat advanced the money to the merchandise company. We get all these boxes of merch, and we're touring, and we're selling them all. We're just stoked. Like, money's coming in. And then, like, about six months later, Erin from Fat calls me. She's like, are you guys going to pay us back for that merchandise? Like we didn't, it didn't occur to us. Yeah. It's totally, totally like just st stupid, you know? We thought, we thought, okay, they're buying us, they bought all these t-shirts for us and we sell it and we keep the money. But like, yeah. no, that's not how it works. Yeah, because so the like, label needs to be paid too. Exactly. Yeah. Like we, but we didn't know. It just like, doesn't occur saying. to like, you. We yeah. Didn't know. <laughs> and they and didn't so, mention it to you in the beginning either. Well, probably they would have thought, you know, like, you know, you just a knew. basic amoeba would know that you got to pay that back, but what? <laughs> We're a special kind of, <laughs> special kind of stupid. Oops. I don't know if I would know that either. I mean, I'm not a musician, but I mean, it, you just kind of think like, oh, they didn't mention yeah, it. Maybe I can it's remember our first tour in Europe. Like we very, our, our first album had just come out. We went to Europe with no use for a name. And I roomed with Tony every night and we would have these talks and he'd be like, so who, who writes your songs? Like, how do you guys split up your royalties? And I was like, you know, I have no idea what you're talking about, dude. And, yeah. And so that stuff can, that stuff can come back and cause friction in a band. For it sure. can cause problems in relationships. So my, I guess my best advice, if you were a band that was like on a way to being somewhat successful, is to like figure that stuff out in the beginning. Yeah. It'd be so much. It's so much easier uh, down the road. Yeah, I mean, because I guess in the beginning you don't think about it because you're playing because you love it and it's a good time. It's a ton of fun. Or it's like he had a riff and then I wrote a riff and then he wrote some lyrics and like. Yeah, you made who, a song. Who, who knows? Who knows who wrote the song? Like, yeah. we, there's no. If for our band anyway, everyone's different. For our band, it was like, I don't even know what, what's a songwriter. Like, I think, I thought Tom Petty was a songwriter. I'm not Tom Petty, like, what are we doing? And so, yeah, a lot of stuff was confusing at first. And then we, you know, we encountered all kinds of problems with disagreements about this and that. And fortunately for us, we had solid help from our label and from friends that knew, knew a thing or two about it. Mm -hmm. To we we could like f figure out a situation where we everybody was happy. Yeah. And w and we haven't looked back since then. But that kind of stuff is you don't even th we didn't even think about it in the beginning. And yeah. later on it was like, "Whoa, we should have thought about that like a long time ago." That's something until now that you've brought it up. I've I've only ever heard that brought up a few times and I mean, I never really think about that with artists either that it's like, yeah, the the specifics of who gets paid for what, <laughs> not just splitting the album sales. It's like, who wrote it? Who you know, did all these things and who gets credit for it. And and the thing is, there's no, as far as I know, there's no right or wrong way to do it. Yeah. But every band gets to decide for themselves. So you be, just might, decide and put it out there. So like, <laughs> one guy might be like, well, my buddy's band does it this way. And he might, well, my buddy's band does it this way. It's like, we should do it this way. And it's like that kind of stuff can, it can, it could distract a band from like the greater mission. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Like figure that stuff out beforehand and then go conquer everything. <laughs> I have been eating vegan for about four months now, but you've been vegan since 1993. What would you, How do you say? Know that? I, I did a lot of research on okay. you. How do I know that? <laughs> so yeah. what would you say to someone who was maybe thinking about going vegan, but was intimidated by it or thought it's not cool? I mean, Morrissey's vegan. Yeah. How much cooler can, can it be than that? A lot of people hate him, though. <laughs> I don't know why. I mean, uh, they say, I don't know what they say about him, but. I don't know what to say to people anymore. It's become... When I see when I see people eating meat, or just the fact that meat exists, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm past the point of just being baffled. And so, part of me just wants to like scream at people. But I'm not a fascist, and it's not up to me to tell people what to do. Yeah. And I used to eat meat. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't until I heard bands like Gorilla Biscuits and Youth of Today and and the Chromags, and then I started thinking about it. And so, I don't know. It's really hard 
because it's so something I'm really passionate about Mm -hmm. and I don't want to get, but I don't want to get in anybody's face. Uh, I think that in my, my hope is that it becomes like smoking. Like people can still smoke if they want to, but it's not cool anymore. I think it's on the way for sure. Actually, you brought up Cro-Mags, the singer from Cro-Mags. I don't know if you've seen it on Facebook. He had like a a cooking show. Oh, we love, we love John Joseph's cooking show. And it was, it's the funniest fucking thing I've ever seen. Like how he's just so angry and he swears and like, he's hilarious. Like, I mean, I feel like he's a good spokesperson for like, this is vegan being cool. I think, yeah. Well, some people aren't going to react well to it. Yeah. But it's going to be really attractive to some other people. And I think it takes all kinds. And I think that the world in general is starting to kind of wise up to it, I guess. And I think that punk and hardcore music can take some of the credit for that. I know that anybody who... I hear it all the time from people who come up to me and say, like, because of your band, like, I'm vegetarian or vegan now. Which is super humbling. Yeah. And, and unexpected at, at the scale that it's happened at. But I know how that feels because I'm that way because of bands. Like I'm, I'm the person I am because of music and lyrics that I listen to, and it got me thinking, kind of outside the box. Uh, you know, because we we get we have a lot of stuff, kind of shoved in our face in this culture, before we're old enough to think for ourselves and form our own opinions. Mm-hmm. And so, so yeah, why why am I drinking milk that's for a baby cow? What's 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 so good about that? You know, and why is it? Why can you go to jail for kicking a dog, but you can? beat the fuck out of some animal in a factory farm and that's okay and they actually pay you for it like the art it's to me it's insane this insane double standard this like wall of like denial denial that we prop up through like advertising and and like cultural traditions and stuff and i think that we need to smash that and really question the normalization of the whole process because it's it's really it's cruel and it's it's brutal and it's insane to me yeah and i used to eat meat so like I can't go around telling people like you're wrong. I'd rather be like I feel better and this is what I did and check it out, you know. Yeah. Um and most everybody that I talk to, they say they feel better. I do. It's only and been so they, 4 they, months they, for they me. They feel but better. <laughs> well, you feel better physically. You feel and then so I I felt better spiritually. I felt like I, you know, cuz like I love animals. So how can I love animals and then at the same time be like participating in that? Mhm. It's it, I can't like those two things can't coexist for me anymore. Um, and so being able to kind of smash that wall and be able to really see that like it's all one thing. And if you love animals, you wouldn't be doing that. Yeah. I mean, if you watch any, you know, any kind of video, there's tons of them on the internet of what happened in the slaughterhouses. It's fucking heartbreaking, man. It just breaks my heart. And I don't think, I, I don't see how any human being could like watch that and be like, yeah, that's cool. I'm down with that. I'm supporting that. I want to go get a burger. Like, yeah. But there's so much, ad- there's, I mean, it's basically advertising is what it is. They tell you it's cool, tell you it's masculine, tell you it's American, tell you it's normal. Yeah. Tell you there's, you know, it's going to boost your virility. And then all these celebrity chefs that we work up, look up to and worship that, that make you think it's like. Big hunks of meat. Look at this yeah. beautiful piece well, of yeah, meat. Like, yeah, you got it going <laughs> on. Like you're high class if you're eating this, you know. Yeah. And we got to smash that. Um, and there's. Yeah, like you said, awareness is growing, and if if the punk and hardcore scene has something to do with it, that's great. Last question. Um, you guys released your last album in 2015. Do you have plans to record a new album anytime soon? We're, we're very much at this point a kind of day by day band. Yeah. Being that we're all kind of long in the tooth. And so uh, I wouldn't rule it out, but we're not on that. We're not on that schedule anymore. Yeah. Like fat's not, not knocking on our door going, where's your next album? Uh, <laughs> I think if we did one, they'd probably be like, oh, cool, rad, a good riddance album, we'll put it out. Yeah. And being the fact that we play music together a lot, uh, I mean, I, I I sit in my living room and there's a guitar over there and sooner or later I'm going to pick it up. Mm-hmm. Uh, something's going to happen. What, Where that goes and how long it takes and what happens, I couldn't tell you. Yeah. I wouldn't rule it out. 
Good to know. Good to know. It's not a no. No. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me tonight. I'm really looking forward to your set. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank, thank you. you. Hey, it's Russ from Good Riddance. You're watching Last Rockers TV. <laughs>